So today's presentation is going to be, as Fatou said, uh, about my project uh, with TMX, which is Deep Unsupervised Anomaly Detection in the Derivatives Market. So just a bit of background, since uh, COVID, uh, we all lived uh, a very much uh, higher market volatility and uh, uncertainty. So usually people to manage their risk will, gonna be, uh, will use derivatives. So as an uh, analysis, uh, as per the analysis of the World Federation of Exchanges, uh, there's been a surge of about 30% in 2020 in the derivatives trading volume. So this in, uh, in fact, uh, directly leads to more data that needs to be uh, analyzed by regulators at exchanges. So whenever we need more data, we need also an increased risk of uh, trading punk, uh, fraud going unnoticed, um, which is uh, a direct threat to trust in capital markets uh, for every market participants. So TMX uh, entered a partnership uh, with Vadu in 2018. So the project that I'll be presenting today is part of a bigger project uh, that we have with uh, Fenomenal colleagues. Um, so even though, uh, even more so uh, for TMX, which uh, has a growing number of market part participants, uh, the problem uh, is even great, uh, greater for them. So usually uh, regulation systems are based on uh, deterministic rules, uh, rules that are expertly defined uh, with uh, static thresholds. So for example, if we take like uh, cold stuffing where a market participant uh, sends a lot of orders and cancel them uh, immediately in order to create lag in the markets. Um, then a ratio of something like number of trades divided by the number of orders sent to the market would be a ratio that could be used uh, by regulators. And uh, a, an optimal static threshold would be uh, used uh, for uh, that instrument. Uh, but different instruments means uh, different statistics, different liquidity, trading volume, et cetera. So, uh, defining exactly the optimal way of uh, uh, detecting frauds based only on uh, deterministic rules is extremely hard. So on the opposite hand, we have machine learning, which is more dynamic. Uh, so it, it offers a very interesting uh, alternative. So firstly, there's no uh, strong underlying assumptions uh, in the model. So it's purely data-driven. Uh, the model is also able to, to adapt to multiple instruments uh, with good pre-processing pre of the data and uh, different market conditions. And also, first and foremost, uh, the machine learning model is able to uh, evolve alongside the market and adapt to uh, more recent uh, fraudulent patterns. Um, so what we want to do with this uh, problem is we have to find a machine learning way of uh, effectively uh, detecting fraudulent patterns in the derivatives market. So to do that, we're going to be relying on, uh, on <clears throat> anomaly detection. So we hope so, since frauds should be very rare in the market, that by definition of uh, anomalies, frauds uh, should be uh, should all be anomalies. But on the opposite, not all uh, anomalies are necessarily frauds. So if we, if we can uh, we can think of really rapid changes in the uh, security price, for example, or very large orders that are sent to the market, uh, by definition, these uh, these orders uh, or these events could also be. Uh, anomalies. So the objectives that we have for this problem is to first transform the market data that we have from TMX in order to be, uh, for it to be machine learning readable. Uh, we also have to create a machine learning best system that would be able to detect any anomalies that happens in the uh, time series data. And finally, we need to uh, uh, integra integrate that framework into TMX's uh, detection systems. So just a little bit of background for the limit order data, so which we call log. Uh, rapidly, this is the collection of all uh, limit orders that are sent to the market by all participants at any given time. Um, for so we have one limit order book for each instrument that are sent uh, that are, that exist in uh, TMX's uh, exchange. Um, and e, whenever a change happens to that limit order book, so where, whether someone sends an order to the market, cancels it, or does in transaction, for example then uh, this changes the log. And this is when we have a new data point to work with. So we have that daily data, so, uh, which, is, which occurs at, at a very high frequency. So usually within one millisecond, we could have multiple uh, changes in the same limit order book. Uh, so we could have hundreds of thousands or sometimes millions uh, of changes in the limit order book for a very liquid instrument, for example. 
Um, so what does it look like? So we have on the left what we call the bid side, where every limit order book that uh, where someone wants to buy the security uh, resides. And we have also on the right uh, the ask prices or the ask side of the limit order book, where every limit uh, buy order, uh, sell order, sorry, uh, resides in the limit order book. So we have in this case uh, four different uh, lim limit order book levels. Uh, one level uh, specifies a, uh, a certain price. Um, so the data that we have, of course, is that limit order book data for multiple instruments and multiple days, uh, instruments that are traded on TMX. And we also have the transactions. So what we have overall is that the, we have the price, the number, number of orders, and the volume for the first five levels of the limit order book. And we also have the price and volume for all transactions that occur for the same instruments and the same days. And we have a millisecond accuracy for that data. So in our case, we have multiple millions of orders to work with. And we have uh, also close to 100 real fraud uh, clusters that have been detected by KMX's team in the past. So we're very lucky to have that, uh, that data. So of course, there's multiple uh, fraudulent patterns that exist. Um, and it'd be, this is only a short list of uh, manipulation techniques that can be algor algorithmically uh, uh, defined. All with the goal of exporting other market, uh, market uh, participants in order to have a better sell or buy price uh, for your transactions. And describing mathematically every possible fraudulent patterns uh, for uh, every possible instrument is not mathematically doable. So uh, this is why machine learning is very interesting in that case. Uh, so for a small example of spoofing, for example, uh, we have on the right here, someone that sends a spoof, uh, spoof bid. So what, what I mean by that is someone that sends a, uh, in order at the first level of the bid with very large volume. So everyone sees that in the limit order book. So it's, it's in public, everyone that trades sees the limit order book. And they see that there's a very high uh, volume or high liquidity in the first level of the limit order book. So people are gonna be starting to also send prices at that level. So whenever uh, the, those people uh, send these uh, new bid orders at, the, at a higher bid price than what was uh, in the limit, limit of the book before, then the uh, fraudster, let's say, uh, let's say uh, cancels its order and then goes up uh, on the other side of the market and sells, the, uh, uh, sells its uh, security at the uh, new best uh, bid price, which was higher than uh, before because of its uh, spoof order. So by sending a false, let's say a false uh, uh, order, then the, the, that person was able to get a better uh, sell price for its security, which was what he wanted to do uh, all along. Larang does the same thing, but sends multiple orders in the market at, the, at different levels, uh, whereas Poofing only sends orders as uh, the first level of the limit order book. So by that, I mean that uh, first we can see that uh, we can see uh, fraudulent patterns only using the limit order book, first level for the spoofing, but we also need deeper uh, levels for the limit order book to detect something like uh, layering. So as I've said, we're gonna be relying on anomaly detection. So anomaly detection, what it is, is, is just the study of uh, trying to differentiate between normal and abnormal data. Uh, so two kinds of data that are not following the same generating process. Um, so what's great, what's a, a greater problem with time series is that we have different types of anomalies. So we have point anomalies, so just specific points in time that are abnormal all by their own. We have also anomalous time series where the entirety of the time series is anomalous. And finally, there are subsequence anomalies, which, what, which is what we are working with. So only uh, very temporal neighborhoods of the, of the time series is abnormal. So in that case, uh, for example, airing, like maybe uh, 100 maybe uh, events would be fraudulent in, at that, in about 200,000 uh, market events in that given day. So machine learning has really overtaken the anomaly detection uh, literature in the recent years. Um, uh, especially uh, in the 2000, we had classical machine learning models. Uh, and uh, about uh, 2012 or 2015, uh, we've started to see deep learning models really outperforming uh, classical and statistical models. So the literature in anomaly detection in time series is some, somewhat scarce. Uh, 
uh, and especially it's, uh, for financial time series. So what has been done so far is that uh, classical machine learning models have been used with daily data in a supervised way. Uh, so basically we would know whenever a certain day had an anomaly in it, in it. So it's not really optimal. Uh, the false positives in that case would be extremely costly to the uh, exchange regulators because yeah, market analysts will need to uh, look at every order that's sent in a specific day. So it's not really optimal. And more recently, we had uh, unsupervised anomaly detection frameworks based uh, uh, on, auto, uh, uh, on autoencoders and GANs, for example, using the metadata data. And uh, unsupervised is very much more adapted to anomaly detection in time series. So um, because as we'll see, real frauds are really ext are extremely rare to have. So using them in a supervised way is not really optimal. So we need to define a way of using only the public data uh, uh, without really uh, relying too much on real fraud cases since most inst institution or people do not really have uh, real fraud cases. So more formally, what we're trying to do is to find a, any subsequence of size n within a, a multivariate uh, time series of uh, length t, uh, length t, sorry, where a uh, a score function is going to be higher than a predefined threshold. So whenever a, a, the anomaly score, which is a function s that takes into input uh, the time series of size m is greater than a, an anomaly threshold, then this is where uh, we say that there's a subsequence anomaly. So the previous literature in anomaly detection is not really perfect for tri a trade fraud detection. So it has a lot of uh, shortcomings. So first of all, the data is uh, a time series. So most of the anomaly detection framework work with uh, tabular data or images. So we need uh, very specific algorithms to work with uh, time series. And the data is multidimensional. So every univariate uh, anomaly detection framework can be used and it's hardly predictable. So predicting exactly the next state of the market like uh, one millisecond after is uh, very hard. So it's debatable whether it's doable or not. So it's really much a problem in itself. So we can't rely on uh, predictive anomaly detection. Uh, the data that we have is extremely noisy. So multiple agents are interacting in the market at the same time. So the, uh, the examples that I've showed you for uh, spoofing and layering are very cookie cutter, uh, cookie cutter uh, examples. So whenever there's multiple act agents acting at the same time, we have a lot of, of noise. So anomaly detection was made for uh, exactly noisy subsequence and anomaly detection, let's say. Uh, the errors of the models are not gonna be stationary. So especially in the case of like uh, autoencoders based on LSTMs, um, the estimation of the time series are extremely hard to do at the beginning and the end of the day, since it's more of a chaotic environment, uh, multiple agents are acting at the same time. Um, so the errors are gonna, of the models are gonna be higher in those periods compared to something like uh, Node, for example. And the frauds, like I've showed you, are very much contextual. So a single, uh, let's say a single uh, order here that provides a better uh, offer price is not in itself uh, anomalous. The fact is, whenever we consider uh, every of these orders, then this is where we say that there's an anomaly. So the context is extremely important. And uh, we have to consider every uh, orders that happen in a temporal uh, neighborhood. And of course, since there's multiple agents, the probability of the orders being uh, contiguous are extremely low. So we can't rely uh, on the previous literature uh, on that. And of course, real fraud cases are extremely rare. So using something like supervised learning isn't uh, really doable. So we have to rely on unsupervised uh, methods. So this is an overview of the framework that we're proposing. So Firstly, we have the R frequency market data, which consists of uh, the limit order book and the transactions data. Uh, we then have to pre-process pre -process that data into four uh, different uh, data sets. So four, this is different from the classical machine learning way of doing things. Uh, so we have the train set, the valid set, and the first set, uh, set of data, but we also have a second set, uh, test set of data. So uh, I'll explain why a bit later where the train and valid sets uh, only have normal data. So time series where no anomalies were detected by TMX in the past. And test one uh, has uh, 
is the first data set that contains frauds and tests to also have uh, uh, frauds in it in order to really uh, quantify how well our model is doing in detecting frauds. So for that, that same uh, three uh, sets of data, we're going to be considering multiple machine learning models. Uh, for each one of them, we're going to be training it on the train set in order to find the optimal parameters, and also the valid set in order to find the optimal hyperparameters for the machine learning models. Once we have these machine learning models that are trying to define that score function, uh, we're going to be uh, creating the time series of these scores in time in order to detect any spikes, let's say, uh, in the model scores. In those spikes, uh, basically, we have to de detect them uh, automatically. So this is where the anomaly detection framework comes in, uh, based on these scores uh, that were created by the machine learning models. And after that, using the first test set, we're going to be scoring our models with uh, real frauds and uh, normal data also. Uh, so once we have trained and selected the optimal N models, we're going to be selecting only the best one and uh, test its performance in the second test that hasn't been used uh, before. So I'm going to be relying on what we call as VDD, uh, which is support vector data description. So just briefly, uh, if everyone knows about uh, support vector machines, this is very close to that. Um, but in this case, we're trying to uh, find a, an optimal hypersphere uh, in a given, given space, in mapping space, with uh, minimal radius. So we want to encapsulate everything that's normal in our data set D and exclude in that uh, optimal hypersphere everything that's anomalous. So only describing uh, the normal data set within a radius R with center C. And uh, everything that falls outside that is close to the hypersphere is going to be called support vectors. So in the case of, let's say, one class support vector machines or support vector machines for binary classification, um, in these cases, we only wanted to find an hyperplane to split uh, the data set, data set. But in that case, we're trying to find an hypersphere that only englobes um, the normal data in our data set. So to do that, we're going to be using a kernel, uh, an positive definite kernel, uh, which uh, creates with a reproducing kernel at Hilbert space with a uh, feature mapping uh, uh, function phi k. So phi k takes into, into input, creates a vector into a new uh, Hilbert space, and we want that vector to be as close as the upper, the upper sphere center as possible. So the SVDD tries to, uh, try, tries to minimize that function here. So visually, what it does in 2D space, um, we have our mapping here that results in from the uh, feature mapping. Um, so we're trying to encapsulate every uh, normal data point, so in the like brown points here, uh, around the uh, center C. And everything that falls outside of it is the uh, or close to it are the support vectors. And these are going to be uh, responsible for detecting exactly the optimal way of uh, bounding that, uh, that region. So there's a problem with that is uh, the kernel. So the kernel is we have very a very small uh, sample of kernels to select from. Uh, so they, we are very limited into the feature mapping that we can learn. So rough and all in 2018, uh, instead of relying on kernels, uh, learn their mapping using neural networks. So in the paper, they use MLPs and CNNs. And basically, uh, whenever we have only normal data in the, in the data set, so whenever we forget about these uh, support, uh, support vectors, we get the following objective function, which is simply uh, the output of the neural network, phi w, uh, in the new space f. Uh, and we want these uh, projections to be as close as possible to see in order to really create a, uh, an optimal hypersphere with minimal uh, volume. So this is the same idea as this, but we're using uh, a neural network instead of relying on kernels. And the authors also added uh, for good measure uh, weight regularization uh, for the L layer neural network uh, phi w. So in that case, what they're trying to do is based on the space X, where we like, <clears throat> where we have uh, our data points that we observe and that we observe. Uh, basically, the uh, machine learning model tries to uh, find the this nonlinear pattern here, outputs it into some uh, the new space here, where we want to have um, these vectors as close as possible to the center C of the uh, optimal hypersphere with minimal radius. And finally, the anomaly score. 
once we that once we've trained uh, our deep learning model uh, with that uh, loss function results in that uh, anomaly score function. So with the optimal weights W star, we can create the anomaly score, which is simply the L2 norm between uh, the mapped uh, vector minus uh, the center C of the hypersphere that has been learned uh, with uh, the deep point class classification framework. So what we're proposing since uh, initially that model was only for tabular data and images, uh, we had to rely on recurrent neural networks to map uh, our vector. So what we use is the LSTMs that everyone knows uh, at this point. Uh, but we've uh, also added temporal attention. So um, the, uh, the idea of using temporal attention is, as I've said previously, uh, only some orders in any given uh, subsequence is going to be abnormal. So by using temporal attention, what we hope for is that uh, it's going to be the model is going to be able to really only focus on these uh, fraudulent orders and not on the entirety of the subsequence, uh, which results in a very uh, less noisy signal of the anomaly. So we take into input a sequence, a subsequence of size m. We feed that to the NLST, to the LSTM. Then using the temporal attention with the hidden uh, representation of the LSTM, uh, we can output finally the, uh, the representation in the uh, new space where we're uh, trying to create the optimal hypersphere. So for good measure, I've also added uh, the formulas. Uh, the only thing that I want to uh, point out is that uh, because of the possible hypersphere collapse problem, uh, whenever basically the model tries to learn the trivial solution of only uh, weights of zeros, then the biases are going to be converging to exactly C. So whatever the input that you give doesn't matter. Basically, the model didn't learn anything. It's going to be all outputted exactly to C. So the hypersphere is going to be of uh, radius zero, basically. So the model didn't learn anything. So to alleviate that problem, we get rid of every bias in the LSTM cells. Um, and for the temporal attention, what's great about that, so it's basically a, a um, byproduct of using attention, is that we get an, uh, an alpha vector, which tells us exactly what orders into that uh, subsequence were important into pr uh, predicting the, the featured map. So basically, when we go back into the, into the past, where we look at the anomaly, <clears throat> anomaly score, and whenever it's really high enough, we'll see exactly uh, how we do that later. But whenever we detect exactly something that is important, um, then the analyst will be able, using the alpha vector, uh, will be able to use that vector uh, to really uh, focus on the abnormal orders into the subsequence. So this is a very neat way of adding uh, explainability into our model. So a graphical, a graphical example of the final output of uh, the model. So in blue, we have the anomaly score of the model. And in uh, red, we have the trade fraud. So the x-axis is, is, is the time. So keep in mind that since it's high frequency, we have thousands of orders into that uh, snapshot. And the score in the uh, y-axis, uh, sorry. So the first thing to note here is that exact, uh, we're, we have two very high peaks at these two trade frauds uh, neighborhoods. But there's also a very high peak here. So remember, at the beginning of the presentation, I said uh, that we'd be relying on anomaly detection. So everything that's uh, anomalous is going to be detected. Uh, but not everything that's uh, anomalous is a fraud. So this is the case here. So maybe something like uh, a high price uh, uh, fluctuation occurred, or something, or a trade with uh, really high volume occurred, and it's not really uh, does not occur very often for that type of instrument, for example. So if we zoom in, so, so for example, if we had uh, to select only like one peak detection uh, or only one peak, sorry, we'd be detecting like only this maximal peak. So uh, it's not because uh, it's necessarily a fraud. So the probability of it being a fraud is not really uh, higher necessarily. Um, so what we need really is to look at, to look at the uh, locally uh, close or the uh, local uh, neighborhood of every score in order to detect really the peaks. So if we zoom in into the same region here that it contains the two uh, trade fraud, 
then we can see that in fact, yeah, um, we've detected with pretty close uh, proximity the exact time of the frauds. Um, another way, another sequence, basically we have the same two high peaks around the same neighborhood, uh, the, another neighborhood, sorry. So this is another case where two trade fraud occurred uh, pretty close to each other. So we also have uh, detected them uh, very closely. Uh, so from that, uh, from that first uh, graphical example, we can see that uh, the anomaly score is not necessarily stationary. Stationary. So uh, previously in the literature, people used like Gaussian uh, estimation for their errors, uh, but in our case, it's not true. Um, so we need a dynamical way of finding of finding the anomalies, which are uh, the the regions where we have the really high scores. Okay. Um, so frauds are very, as I've said, are very much contextual. So we only need to really look at the local uh, data points in order to detect whether uh, a peak is a, really an anomaly or not. And uh, as I've said, it might not necessarily have the highest score in each given day, uh, like the first graph here presented. So for that, in order to uh, circumvent that problem, we're going to be using a dynamic anomaly threshold. So basically, in the literature, uh, people were using static. Uh, Tau, which is the anomaly threshold. But in our case, we're going to be using the uh, uh, the sample uh, distribution of the previous n uh, time series. Um, so the first uh, anomaly detection framework that we're proposing is based on the Chebyshev inequality. So basically, whenever uh, the score of the subsequence goes over its uh, sample mean plus a certain uh, multiplicator times a uh, standard deviation of the distribution of the scores previous uh, to that subsequence, then we say that there's an anomaly. So previously in the literature, literature it was only uh, tau. So you were uh, to only uh, optimize tau and not um, and not using a dynamic threshold there like we do. So if we use that uh, anomaly detection, uh, if we go back to the first graphical example, then in that case. Uh, we're able to select, yes, uh, so there's no way around it, basically. So we have detected that first high peak, but we have, we've also uh, detected um, these two peaks that were really interesting to us. So by using the dynamic uh, framework, we we're also able to not select that peak here, since we've seen that uh, we have very high variability in that neighborhood. So that peak might not be really anomalous compared to this local distribution. Uh, but on the opposite here, we see that there was low variation in that neighborhood. So that peak here uh, was also uh, detected sadly. So this is still pretty good. So we had two false positives for two, uh, two true uh, positives in that case uh, with fairly high accuracy. So the, we were extremely close to the real uh, trade frauds. So what we're doing now, uh, what I'm working on right now is how to effectively uh, score the models and how to select the optimal ones. So what we're going to be using is the uh, precision recall AUC, uh, where we define the true positives as being the true frauds whenever we have a peak that has been detected within M uh, market events. Uh, false positives are also going to be the peaks where no uh, real frauds occurred within uh, M events. And finally, the false negatives is going to be the true frauds uh, where we had basically no peak around it uh, within M events. So what we do is that we're going to be computing that score, so the EPR AUC, uh, using the test one. Uh, so this is where we score the model. So once we've trained the model, created the time series of the scores using the uh, one class set STM with attention, uh, we're going to be also uh, detecting the peaks with the uh, Chebyshev inequality that I've showed you. And then where this is where we score the model using the uh, three statistics that I've shown you. And once we've uh, basically selected the optimal model for each type of model, then we can only select the optimal one based on the ISPR AUC, and then output its score on the uh, te second test uh, set that we've never used before in our training or our uh, hyperparameter selection. Um, okay, so for our future works, we still need to test more models um, and hyperparameters to really have uh, an optimal model. So 
Right now, what we have is very high recall, but we still have a bit of problem with uh, false positives. Um, so we need a way to find, uh, to go around that problem. And once the framework is fully implemented, uh, then we need, we'll, what we'll have is the ability to create a continuous feedback with the analysts at TMXs, at TMX, uh, which is gonna be creating a new label data set for us to uh, optimize our model. So this opens the door to semi-supervised learning. So based on the anomalies that are returned by our current framework, then the analyst can say, this is not an, a real anomaly. This is not a fraud that is, in, that is interesting. So uh, the model is gonna be able to focus more and more on the actual fraud uh, themselves, uh, instead of something like a, uh, a high trade price or high trading volume, something like that. Um, so the current framework that we have only considers the limit order book data and the transaction data. Uh, so that does not uh, cover exactly uh, every type of uh, frauds that can occur in the market. So we can think of it cyber trading, which uh, requires like news or uh, outside information from the market. Um, so what we're aiming for uh, next year is to have a int full integration with the market news uh, and uh, an NLP system of uh, PAMU, which also presented uh, his work uh, five months ago uh, with Fenema. Uh, so this opens the door to a more, uh, to a bigger ensemble of possible frauds uh, or fraud patterns that can be detected. So in conclusion, uh, we've presented the problem of trade uh, manipulation uh, in today's market. We've presented an anomaly detection uh, on time series and uh, how the, the previous literature had some shortcomings that needed to be uh, resolved. And we've presented a new type of deep unsupervised learning uh, framework that can be used on the limit order book time series data. Uh, we've also showed how to adapt our model to the, that time series and how to detect effectively the uh, peaks in the scores. Uh, and so this is a complete anomaly detection framework, uh, as I've showed uh, from end to end, basically starting with the high frequency data uh, up to the end where we uh, can output finding the uh, real anomaly scores in the, in the data. Oops. So thank you. Uh, if you have any comments or questions, I'll be more than happy to, to answer them. Bonjour. Bonjour. Hello. Euh, je vous entends presque pas. Avez-vous une question? Il y avait question? Yes. Hello. Oui, uh, Charlie. Yeah, but barely. It's open now. Yeah, yeah, you can, uh, you can, uh, you can answer your question. Okay, yeah. Usually, for this type of data, like anomaly detection, we usually we, we, we typically have the balance problem. I don't see how you, you address the, the, this type of problem. That's the first. And second, uh, for I don't see how you, you set up uh, business uh, interaction metrics because something like. Uh, accuracy and so on is not that valuable in the business context. How do you deal with it? Do you have a secret of the or you don't know? I'm sorry, I can't really decipher what you what you're saying is very much noisy. I don't know if you can speak a little bit closer to your microphone or Uh, yeah, though, so there's not really an imbalance problem since there, it's in an unsupervised uh, learning way. So we only use normal data. So basically the data that was considered normal by TMX's analysts. Uh, so there's no class imbalance. So we only have normal data. So this is the uh, unsupervised way of doing things. So this, we don't have really an imbalance problem. Yeah, good question.
So this is why basically we use the viewpoint class uh, classification system. So this only relies on normal data. So we don't make any difference between something that's normal or not because we only have uh, normal data. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for, for your question. Are there any other questions? It can be both in French or in English. I don't know. Uh, do you investigate business related metrics like profit or cost? Uh, no, not really. Uh, we're really only, only interested in finding uh, frauds in the uh, market. Yeah. Um, yeah. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Ernest. Uh, can we get a copy of these slides or links to the relevant papers in your contract? Contact? Uh, yeah, my contact is basically the LinkedIn, to LinkedIn here. Uh, Fatou, do we give the uh, attendance the uh, slides of the presentation? Um, Cedric, do you want me to send you the, the attendance list? Oh, yeah, sure. Okay, I can do it. So if anyone is interested in the slides, uh, I can send your present your. Uh... Oh, I send all of them the the presentation. Oh, okay, yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I send all, all of them. The okay, good. And yeah, the, the 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 video link too. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, so basically, the papers are cited. Uh, the only. Only two citations are used. Uh, so basically, of, of course, the papers has more citation, but uh, the two main relevant papers are cited here. Uh, so basically, the SVDD and the deep one class classification. Um, but there's also maybe one or two papers that do uh, fraud detection using like uh, LSTM motor encoders and GANs. Uh, but it's fairly easy to, uh, to find. Thank you. So Any other question? Yeah. Uh, it's purely research oriented, but of course, we aim to implement that framework within TMX's uh, system. So it's partially done so, so far. But yeah, the research work has a direct implication within the TMX's business. Do you hear me now? Yeah, but the sound is very, uh, very bad. Okay. So are there any other questions? Uh, maybe if we can then uh, hear Fatou. Yeah. So thank you a lot, Cédric, for the last conferences thank you. of the year. And thank you, Ernest, too, uh, for your participation. You have, um, you always have a relevant question. Yes. <laughs> Happy yeah. holidays, everyone. So thank we'll you see you on, on January. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thank you again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. No, 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 no. <laughs>